This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice as we lift his name. This is the day that the Lord has made. Come and rejoice. We will rejoice and be glad in Good morning, everyone. It's got a few announcements for you this morning. Uh, first announcement, life groups are starting this week. Uh, if you need a reminder, if you know you signed up for a life group, but you need a reminder on what one you signed up for, uh, post it down in our entrance area. Uh, all the lists are typed up to tell you where it's meeting at, who's leading it, uh, day and time. Uh, so check that out. If you didn't sign up for one yet and would still like to, there is still room for a couple of people in our Wednesday afternoon life group, uh, and there's still plenty of room in our Saturday morning one. So I'll pass those clipboards around again this morning. Um, while I'm speaking on clipboards, we also have a couple events coming up here. Uh, end of January, beginning of February, we'd like to start getting uh, people signed up for. End of the month is our annual chili cook-off. That's going to be January 28th. Uh, Sign-up sheet is pretty self-explanatory. Write your name down if you want to bring a chili, a bread, or a cider, or a dessert. Uh, the other one, beginning of January, uh, be February 9th, is our ladies' banquet. This is an evening that is served to um, help encourage the ladies of our church. Uh, <clears throat> this is also an evening where the men will serve the ladies. We put... Uh, put on the dinner, the serve it, and everything. We have a, a guest speaker coming again this year. Um, it's a great time of fellowship, and so I would encourage you ladies, uh, sign up, invite your friends. Um, so I'll pass that around. Uh, with the life groups, if you look inside of your bulletin, you're going to find a half-sheet page. This is a guide to kind of help um, cover conversation, guide conversation uh, as it pertains to uh, this series that we're currently working through. Uh, so put that in your Bible, bring it along with you to your group meeting this week. Um, <clears throat> also, you'll find in your bulletin our yearly calendar. Uh, this has got all of the really important events that you need to know about, um, all the regular ones. Uh, there may be some others that pop up throughout the year here, uh, but this will kind of have in mind everything that you need to know we have coming up this upcoming year. Uh, as far as other announcements, next week, January 14th, we have our uh, regular board meeting. We also have X1013 meeting. On the 20th, the young adults will be meeting, and then uh, chili cook-off and the ladies' banquet. Uh, outside of that, any and all other announcements as far as uh, midweek ministries and stuff um, should be on the back of the bulletin. We will start back up the uh, outreach this Wednesday now that school is back in session. So for those who have been helping out with that uh, salt and light outreach, we will be meeting this, uh, this Wednesday. I will send a reminder out about that. Any announcements that I may have missed? Nope? Okay, join us for our call to worship, please. If you will stand with me, if you are able, for the call to worship. Respond to my, to, with my uh, call. Clap your hands, all peoples. Shout to God with loud songs of joy. He chose our heritage for us, the pride of Jacob, whom he loves. God has gone up with a shout, the Lord with a shout, with the sound of a trumpet. Sing praises to God, sing praises, sing praises to our King, sing praises. For God is the King of all the earth, sing praises with a psalm. God reigns over the nations. 
God sits on his holy throne. The branches of the people gather as the people of the God of Abraham. For the shields of the earth belong to God. He is highly exalted. Let us pray. Father God, you are indeed our God, uh, a God of love, a God of peace, a God of joy. You are on the throne. You have all things in control. It is with great awe and insight that we look toward your wisdom as your plan unfolds for this world. Even though we see many things of strife and concern, we know that you are in charge. So, Father, we pray for your your presence among us, that you not turn your back on us, and that we will respond with joy and love toward you. As we gather here now in this place to worship you, we pray for your spirit to open our hearts and minds, keep us alert that we may glean from the message from Pastor Ben as he brings it to us. In your son's name we pray. Amen.
up to 293 for Amazing Grace. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Burr Oak. I am Pastor Ben, and it is my humble joy to be able to bring you God's Word today. I'm going to apologize uh, right off the bat. Uh, I am dealing with some seasonal sinus stuff, and it's created this really annoying cough, and uh, uh, it may delay the flow of this, so my apologies to begin with. If you are visiting for the first time today, I would encourage you to fill out one of our Connect cards. The easiest way to do this is actually to go to our website, baroque.org, and fill it out there. Uh, we do have some physical cards here in person, if you would prefer to do it that way. Uh, our regular attendees, if you go to baroque.org, you actually have the ability to update all your own personal information for our online directory, as well as mark yourself present for today to help us with our attendance keeping records. I would encourage you to utilize that tool. Well, today we're going to start a series that has been uh, a little more than a year in planning. Uh, and I'm going to tell you up front that in all honesty, I have uh, probably a healthy dose of hesitation in even bringing this series to our church family. If you remember a year ago, when we worked through our series, uh, The Purpose of the Church, which pop quiz, what are the three purposes of the church? Exalt God, edify the, edify the saints, and evangelize the lost. Very good. I'm not going to let you let go of that. But as we work through that series, I mentioned at a couple of different points that uh, our God left two institutions in this life to point to him. One of them being the church, the second being the marriage relationship. This series is going to look at the latter of the two, the marriage relationship. Yet this series is not going to be your typical marriage series. In the typical marriage series, you often cover briefly God's design for marriage, the role of the husband, the role of the wife, sex, child rearing, and a few other topics. And while we're going to touch on several of these things, 
the primary emphasis of this series is going to be the aspect of the marriage relationship that sets it apart from every other type of relationship, and that being sex, that being physical intimacy. And what we will come to see is that sex impacts every aspect of the marriage relationship, from design to roles to child rearing. The title of this series There we go. The title of this series is Intoxicated by Design, A Theology of Sex. Now you might be wondering why such a title? Doesn't the Bible warn us not to be intoxicated? Now the title for this series comes from a passage in the Bible where men are actually instructed to be intoxicated, and that's Proverbs chapter 5, verses 18 through 20 which read, let your fountain be blessed and rejoice in the wife of your youth, a lovely deer, a graceful doe. Let her breast fill you at all times with delight. Be intoxicated always in her love. Why should you be intoxicated, my son, with a forbidden woman and embrace the bosom of an adulteress? See, as Christians, we know that we are to be sober-minded and ready to give an answer at any moment. Yet when it comes to the sexual relationship between a husband and his wife, he is to be intoxicated with her. He is to be drunk on her love alone, not looking anywhere else. Yet, yet if we step outside of ourselves, <coughs> if we look at the reality of the culture around us, we see a very different picture. We see men who are intoxicated on the sex act itself, and not their wife. They seek to get their fill, whether through the forms of other women or through pornography. We see women who use sex as a way to hold power over their husbands, only dealing it out as a treat for a dog when they've accomplished a trick. We see boys and girls so confused about what sex is that they go to great lengths to deform their bodies in hopes to find happiness in their sex lives. And yet, while the Bible has much to say about sex from cover to cover, there is still enough gray area that immense amounts of confusion still seep in. And it's how we handle these gray areas that determine how well we'll flourish in these lives in regards to our relationship with Yahweh. Now, before I go much further, there are a few things that I want to say at the start of this series. First, if you are uncomfortable hearing about this topic preached on in church, I understand. Many are. I would first encourage you to fight against your discomfort and see what God has to say regarding this topic. If you are still not ready for this topic, you are welcome to go down to our fellowship hall and enjoy coffee and congregate with others who may feel the same. Now for the younger ones here, if your parents or grandparents that are here with you are unsure about you hearing about this topic at this time, you are welcome to join our junior church. Next, there are going to be things that we talk about over the next several weeks that are going to be uncomfortable. There's no way around it when we talk about this topic. And I will be honest, ladies, my concern is primarily for you. With this husband, I'm going to ask you that you lead your wives. Help them work through their concerns. We all need to remember that none of us know fully and all of us are trying to grow closer to Christ. Connected to this is the fact that I do not want this series to be just a series of lectures. I want this to be a conversation. That is why in our life groups each week, you're going to reread the passage that the message is on and talk about the points and use that guide to help guide conversation. The other way that we're going to encourage this to be a conversation is I encourage you to bring your uh, questions forward whether you bring them forward in life group or whether you want to uh, submit them anonymous, anonymously. If you look, if you open up your bulletin, the front cover, you'll see this QR code. That QR code takes you to an online form that's completely anonymous for you to submit your question. Now, if you're not one who utilizes uh, technology like that, you are also free to take a scrap piece of paper, tear it out of your bulletin or whatever, Write your question and submit it in the box on the back divider of our sanctuary. And then 
at various points through this series, I'm going to take time to answer those questions. I want this to be a conversation, not just a series of lectures. There is no question off the table. You are free to ask whatever you want, as long as it is all helping us grow closer to Christ in this conversation. Now finally, why do a sermon series like this? Is it not rather dangerous to approach this topic? What do I hope to accomplish through it? Well, as I mentioned above a little earlier, there seems to be a lot of chaos and confusion surrounding sex in our culture. And that is the primary reason why I feel it's necessary for us to work through this series. See, the conversation about sex takes place every day, all day long around us. And if the biblical voice is not present in that conversation, it is my conviction that the voice of truth is not present in the conversation. Another part of the reason is that many of you here have heard my personal testimony. It was my own misunderstanding and misuse of Yahweh's design for sex that's entrapped me for so long. As I've done some prep work for this series, I've come to understand that I'm not alone, that I'm not alone in a desire to know more about what our God has to say regarding this topic. Now finally, what do I hope to accomplish? In all honesty, I hope to equip you to engage in this conversation for the sake of your kids and grandkids. See, I realize that for many of you, what we are going to talk about over the next several weeks you may feel does not apply to your relationships any longer. Now, first and foremost, my prayer would be that this is not the case and that through this series, you would find a renewal and revival of sexual desire within your marriages. For those of you that, who have never been married, I pray that this series lays a foundation for you that serves to keep you from some of the pitfalls that others of us have had to experience. Now, what will this series not do? It will not tell you what is allowed or not allowed within the marriage relationship between a, a husband and his wife. This is that gray area that many of us do not like. But even within this gray area, there are guiding principles that we can look to for help in governing our sex lives. It is one of these sets of principles that is going to be our focus verse for this series. So go ahead and please say this with me. Galatians 5, verses 13 through 14. For you were called to freedom, brothers... Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Galatians 5, 13 and 14. Good, go ahead and say it again. good. Now another aspect of this series <coughs> that I'm going to add uh, as we get ready to pray for this message, one of the intents of this series is to help husbands and wives grow closer together. So if your spouse is here with you today as we pray, I would ask that you would hold hands with one another. Praying together, physically connected, is a great way of growing closer to your spouse. So please pray with me. Father, you have again allowed us to come together today. Lord, as we prepare to see, receive your word, we ask that you'd open our hearts and our minds to understand it. As we prepare to study your word in regards to what can be a very sensitive topic, Lord, we really ask, open our hearts and minds. Help us to be drawn closer to you more than anything else. Father, we ask that you present yourself to us today. You know the way in each one of us need to see you. So, Lord, we seek your presence above all else. Father, we ask your blessing on our message for today. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, since the main purpose of this series is to be able to enter into the overall cultural conversation about sex, we need to first look at why we are here as a culture. The title of our message for today is the problem, sex and the shortcomings of the church. And we're going to start by looking to 1 John chapter 1, verses 5-10. through 10. If you brought your own Bible or want to follow along on your device, please bring that up. If you're going to use the Blue Pew Bible, it's on page 1122. 
or you can follow along on the screen. 1 John chapter 1, verses 5 through 10. Let us hear the word of the Lord. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaimed to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus his son cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. As we work through this passage today and connect it to the topic of sex, we're going to look at three biblical truths. We're going to look at Yahweh's proclamation, our deception, and our action. So opening up this section, John says that the message they come bearing is the message that was proclaimed by Yahweh, the first part of verse 5. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaimed to you. This message that is proclaimed is that the word of life has been seen. <coughs> John opens this letter explaining this in verses 1 through 3. He says, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and have touched with our hands, concerning the word of life, the life was made manifest, and we have seen it, and testify to and proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and was made manifest to us, that which we have seen and heard and proclaim also to you, so that you too may have fellowship with us, and indeed our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. Death is no longer an issue because eternal life has come from Yahweh through his son, Jesus the Christ. That is the message that was proclaimed, the message of life, first proclaimed by Yahweh and now being proclaimed by the disciples. But why is this a big deal? The big deal was and is that the word of life has the power to make things new to bring things that are dead back to life. That where mourning and sorrow, where hurt and pain dwell, they were being ushered out and new life was being brought back in their place. The reason for this is wrapped up in Yahweh's character, the last part of verse 5, that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. Now the metaphor of light and dark is something that we read often within Scripture. Enough that we understand that light equates to that which is right, holy, and just, and darkness equates to that which is wicked, self-serving, and destructive. Now, commenting on this metaphor, John Stott says this about Yahweh. He says, It is his nature to reveal himself, as it is the property of light to shine, and the revelation is of perfect purity and unutterable majesty. Now, helping to understand this metaphor better, Oswald Chambers says this, Darkness is my point of view. My right to myself. Light is God's point of view. So Yahweh is light. And not only is there no darkness in him, but he shines light on the darkness and casts it out. In the opening to his gospel, John makes these same comments regarding Jesus. John 1, verses 3 through 5. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life. And the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Yahweh's character is that of light. Light casts out that which is wicked and replaces it with justice. Light casts out that which causes death and destruction and replaces it with life. Light casts out that which is wrong and replaces it with that which is holy. It is important for us to understand these aspects of Yahweh's character. But I would ask again, why? Why, at the start of a series about sex, do we need to define and clarify Yahweh's character? How are these connected? 
See, it is important in understanding that sex was such an intricate part of Yahweh's creation of mankind and their experience in this life that is spoken of within the account of mankind's creation. Genesis 1, verses 27 and 28. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over everything. He then dove further into this in chapter 2. In chapter 2, verses 24 and 25, it says, Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother, hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. And then closing out the creation account, back to Genesis 1, verse 31, And God saw that everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. Yahweh created mankind, told them to multiply their kind. They were naked but knew no shame. And this was seen by Yahweh as very good. See, the reason we need to understand Yahweh's character in connection with sex is that Yahweh is the creator of sex and he has deemed it to be very good. Yet I would ask you, when it comes to how we think, talk, and respond to sex and any topic connected to it, do we see them as something connected and belonging in the light or something that belongs to the darkness? This brings us to our second point, our deception. Coming back to our passage for today, John gives us a strong warning that we need to listen to in verses 6 through 8. Because if we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. <coughs> After proclaiming Yahweh's character, John moves to stating three things as Christians we need to realize. The first thing he states is that if we claim to have fellowship but habitually practice sin, we are liars. What does this mean? Seeing how we can never be free of sin in this life, that means there's going to be moments when we do sin. So what does it mean to habitually practice sin? It means that we're unashamed of our sin, that we run to it as a vice, that we justify and excuse it away, that we're unrepentant of it. And if we claim to be a Christian, but we live that way in regard to our sin, we are a liar. The second point is if we operate as God has called us to, we can have fellowship with each other by the blood of Jesus. But what does that mean? Does that mean simply trying to keep the letter of the law? Does that simply mean trying our hardest to be good? No. We know that's futile. What it means is that if we understand the concept of a life of repentance, where we're seeking out where that sin is in our life, we're self-reflective on it, and we're repenting of it, then we maintain in fellowship with each other, all of us covered by the blood of Christ. And finally, if we claim to be without sin... We are under deception, and we are not truly part of the brethren. See, if we can't see sin anywhere in our life, and we're presenting as we are without sin, we are deceived. And if we operate under that deception, then we are, in fact, not as close to Christ as we think. One of the things that we need to see is the emphasis that John is putting on our connection or fellowship with Yahweh and one another. These three points are the proving points that we really are Christian. While we cannot be free of sin, we hate our sin. We strive to live our lives as God has directed us to so that we may live in a commonality with other believers. If we present that we are without sin, then we are deceived. Our lives are to be marked by advocating for what Yahweh has called good and true 
living with each other in a way that works for a common purpose, and the continual repentance of our own sins. That's what our lives are to be marked as. Now, seeing in our last section that Yahweh has called sex very good, this means that as a church, as a Christian culture, if we treat sex as a part of life that belongs in darkness or something other than very good, then we're not living by the truth. We've broken down at that first point. We're taking something that God has deemed as very good and saying, no, that is in fact not very good. When we do that, when we deny that sex is something that needs to be talked about or we simply ignore it but operate as though life is grand, we live under a deception. And when those who are supposed to be presenting truth and life to the world around them live in deception, then we can expect nothing else than the world to be deceived as well. I've heard many Christians contemplate and wonder why the sexual topic within the general culture seems to have gone so crazy. Well, I'll tell you why. We cannot expect a culture that does not live according to God's will and word to have a better clarity on a topic than the church does. If the church is deceived on a topic, you can expect that the general culture around them is going to be far greater deceived than they are. When we operate under a deception, it causes the culture around us to be even greater deceived than we are. And this is where it is. When it comes to sex, this is exactly where our world is at. For example, I want you to think for a moment. If I asked you to define sex, how would you define it? I want to give you several examples of how the world in general defines sex. And you can see how close your own quick definition came up, measured up to them. <clears throat> women's Health Matters, a subset of the Women's Health Center of Canterbury, Australia, defines sex as all acts that can sexually arouse you. The Sexuality Education Resource Center of Winnipeg, Manitoba, Canada, defines sex as an activity in which one, two, or more people use words or touch to arouse themselves and or each other. <coughs> the blog site Teen Health Source defines sex as pretty much anything that feels sexual. How you choose to define sex might be a moving target during your teen years. According to the magazine Seventeen, Honestly, the exact definition of sex doesn't really matter. So is Miss Orenstein correct? Does the definition of sex not really matter? Is it okay that it's a moving target, meaning what is sex one day could not be sex the next day? Can it include any number of people? Is it only that which arouses you? Notice that while there might be some similarities between these definitions, there are many differences as well. This is what causes the confusion as to what sex is. What is okay and what is not? Where is the line? And when the church is unwilling to talk about sex, let alone define it, it adds to the confusion. So how do we define sex? What is it really? If we're going to talk about its purpose, we need to first know what it is. So this is going to be my definition. This is the definition for this series that we're going to use as a functional or working definition of sex. Sex is an act of worship that unites two people mentally, physically, emotionally, spiritually, that begins prior to physical touch and amplifies as touch increases. I believe this definition encompasses what Yahweh has revealed in his word about what sex is. 
I also believe that this definition fits regardless of whether the sex is holy sex amongst the husband and his wife within the covenant of marriage or unholy sex between a man and woman, a same-sex couple, and can include events such as rape, incest, or pedophilia. This describes what sex is, and ultimately it is an act of worship. When we walk in the light, sex is an act that worships Yahweh. And when we walk in the dark, sex is an act that worships false gods. But fortunately, there is hope. We are not left to our own devices when it comes to renewing our understanding about sex and growing to live in a way that honors our God with this aspect of our lives. But this does take action on our part. Coming back to our passage for today, John gives us some insight as to where our action should be in verses 9 and 10. He says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. Now, as we come to this last section from our passage today, John presents two conditional statements. A conditional statement is when there is a listed action and an outcome based on the condition of that action. In verse 9, the condition we see is that if we confess our sins, Yahweh is faithful to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The, condition in state, the conditional statement in verse 10 is that if we claim to be without sin, then we make Yahweh a liar and he's not really in us. Our confession is is the condition that we need to meet for the application of forgiveness and cleansing. But what really is confession? The word that John uses here relates to that of public proclamation. Commenting on confession in his commentary on 1 John, <coughs> Colin Kerr states this, he says, confession of sin is not a theme that is found often in the New Testament. It is found in only four other places. It occurs in the synoptic accounts of the ministry of John the Baptist when people are coming, when people came and confessing their sins to be baptized by him. It is also found in James 5.16, where in the context of praying for the sick, people are urged to confess their sins and pray for each other that they may be healed. People in Ephesus confessed their evil deeds and burned their magical books during the ministry of Paul in that city. In each of these cases, confession of sin was public, not private, just between the individual and God. It may then be the case that here in 1.9, the author also has in mind public confession of sin. We cringe at the idea of public confession of sin. And the unfortunate reality is that it is understandable why most Christians do, why they shrink back from this idea. See, far too often, the public confession of sin has not been handled biblically within the church, especially if the sins are sexual in nature. What we need to understand is that public proclamation does not mean that you have to stand in front of your whole church revealing the depths of your soul. Heath Lambert, in his book, Finally Free, Fighting for Purity with the, with the Power of Grace, takes chapter 5 to talk about how to fight against sexual temptation with confession. Now, he has several points that he lists to understand this, but when it comes to public proclamation, he sums it up by saying this. He says, the Bible has much to say about confessing sin, and we can't look at all of it here, but if I were to try and boil a dozen of verses down to one principle, I would say that the circle of your confession should be as broad as the circle of your sin. Your circle of confession should, <coughs> should be as big and no bigger, that's the key, as big and no bigger than the circle your sin has affected. 
See, we cannot live as though we are free from sin. And when we fail to confess to those that we need to confess to, we functionally live as though we are without sin. I want you to understand that. When we fail to confess to those that our sin has affected, we functionally live as though we are without sin. And if we are functionally living as though we are without sin, we've just seen in this passage that we are liars. And if we let this go on long enough, failing to confess the unrepentance of our sin, if we let this go on long enough, we will begin to sense that things are not right. Maybe even deal with what we might call depression. Now speaking to this, Spurgeon states, it does not spoil your happiness to confess your sin. The unhappiness is in not making the confession. When we hide away our sins, when we fail to confess them, we make Yahweh out to be a liar and his word is not in us. We must strive to confess our sins and live in the reality that when we do, our God is faithful and just by forgiving them and cleansing us of the wickedness that dwells in us. He's promised that to us. He's faithful to forgive. It is important for us to understand this principle at the start of a series like this. Now first, we need to understand this principle because there is this idea that churches shy away from the topic of sex and anything that has to do with it. This is something that churches need to confess of. By the church having this view, it has caused a retreat on the front of purity within the lo their local community, and the church needs to again confess of that. And by the mere nature of this series and the topic we're talking about, there may be those within this congregation that have been harboring sexual sins, hiding them away, wanting to confess, but worried about how they would be viewed if they did. So yes, we need to understand that confession is right and holy and keeps us in right relationship with Yahweh and each other according to the Bible. Now in closing today, I want to share with you a couple excerpts from the book Sex, Romance, and the Glory of God by C.J. and Carolyn Mahaney. The majority of the book is written by C.J. and addressed to men, but the last chapter is written by Carolyn to the wives. This section will help you understand, in part, how it is we have arrived culturally at the point we are at. The first excerpt is of Carolyn sharing an experience she had at a church leadership conference. She goes on to state, Several years ago, at a church leadership conference, I hosted a panel of pastor's wives at a women's session. We fielded questions on a wide variety of topics, from child rearing to counseling women in crisis situations. Then a woman from the audience posed a question. What is one thing you have learned that encourages your husband the most? As the other women on the pencil answered, I pondered my response. I know what CJ's answer would be, but, bear, but dare I say that? And then it was my turn. Make love to him, I blurted out. That's what my husband would say if he were here. The room erupted into a wave of nervous, knowing laughter. It's true. Engaging in this physical expression of marital intimacy and union is one of the most meaningful ways I can encourage my husband. If you watch TV, go to the movies, or read magazines today, you can get the idea that the only, peop that the only people having sex or good sex are the ones who aren't married. If marital sex is even portrayed in popular media, it seems bland or routine. Our culture has pushed marital sex into the back room and instead celebrates immoral sex. Now this book was published 20 years ago. Given that she stated the event happened several years prior, we could guess that it was nearly 30 years ago that that event took place. And we see the response when that topic is brought up. Nervous, knowing, laughter. This nervous hesitation to the topic of sex in church has been around for a long time. 
In fact, Carolyn goes on to share a letter trying to show how big of an issue this has been. She goes on to share a letter from 1894 titled, and I got to take a big deep breath because these titles were like really long. <coughs> she shares a letter from 1894 titled, Instruction and Advice for the Young Bride on the Conduct and Procedure of the Intimate and Personal Relationship of the Marriage State for the Greater Spiritual Sanctity of the Blessed Sacrament and the Glory of God. By Ruth Smithers, wife of Reverend L.D. Smithers. So here is a letter that a pastor's wife in 1894 wrote, advice to a young bride on her wedding night. Mrs. Smithers writes, To the sensitive young woman who has had the benefit of proper upbringing, the wedding day is ironically both the happiest and most terrifying day of her life. On the positive side, there is the wedding itself, in which the bride is the central attraction in a beautiful and inspiring ceremony, symbolizing her triumph in securing a male to provide for all her needs for the rest of her life. On the negative side, there is the wedding night, during which the bride must pay the piper, so to speak, by facing for the first time the terrible experience of sex. At this point, dear reader, let me concede one shocking truth. Some young women actually anticipate the wedding night ordeal with curiosity and pleasure. Beware such an attitude. A selfish and sensual husband can easily take advantage of such a bride. One cardinal rule of marriage should never be forgotten. Give little, give seldom, and above all, give grudgingly. Otherwise, what could have been a proper marriage could become an orgy of sexual lust. On the other hand, the bride's terror need not be extreme. While sex is at best revolting and at worst painful, it has to be endured and has been by women since the beginning of time and is compensated for by the monogamous home and by the children produced through it. It is useless in most cases for the bride to prevail upon the groom to forego the sexual initiation. While the ideal husband would be one who would approach his bride only at her request and only for the purpose of begetting offspring, such nobility and unselfishness cannot be expected from the average man. Most men, if not denied, would demand sex almost every day. The wise bride will permit a maximum of two brief sexual experiences weekly during the first months of marriage. As time goes by, she should make every effort to reduce this frequency. Feigned illness, sleepliness, and headaches are among the wife's best friends in this matter. Arguments, nagging, scolding, and bickering also prove very effective if used in the late evening about one hour before the husband would normally commence his seduction. Clever wives are on the alert for new and better methods of denying and discouraging the amorous overtures of the husband. A good wife should expect to have reduced sexual conducts to once a week by the end of the first year of marriage and to once a month by the end of the fifth year of marriage. By their 10th anniversary, many wives have managed to complete their childbearing and have achieved the ultimate goal of terminating all sexual contacts within, with the husband. By this time, she can depend upon his love for the children and social pressures to hold the husband in the home. I hope you notice the negative themes of this letter that was written in 1894 and how many of those themes have carried through into modern culture. I also hope you would notice how many unbiblical themes are in this letter. This letter written by a pastor's wife to young women indicate that sex, its only purpose is for bringing children into this world. See, what we're going to discover in this series is that was not its intended purpose originally. This letter from 1894 presents that sex is something that belongs in the dark. If you read any Christian literature on the issues of sex in our current culture, they're going to point to the sexual revolution of the 1960s. And they're going to say that is where the issues began. And that is part of why we are here today. 
But the sexual revolution of the 1960s happened because of the church's understanding of sex in the late 1800s. Our culture is where it is at sexually, primarily because of a church's attitude towards sex. And that's something the church needs to confess on. Now, does that mean that we go out with megaphones in our city streets and say we confess of this? No, I don't think that's what it looks like. What it looks like is us becoming educated on what God's word really has to say about this topic. It looks like us getting deeper answers than, well, that's what God's word says when the topic comes up. It looks like us celebrating what holy sex is and not shying away from it. This is a conversation that the church never should have stepped away from, but it did. And so it is my prayer that this series will be an encouragement to all of you by the time we get to an end of it. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your word. Lord, may you continue to guide us and direct us in understanding the principles that you have given us for living this life in a way that honors and glorifies you. That in the way we live would become a testimony to the community around us. Father, we thank you for this day. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Please pray with me. Father, this is the day that you have made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Lord, you are the one that has caused all things to be and in whom all things find their being. Let us forever praise your name. Lord, we do come before you this morning in repentance, seeking forgiveness for our sins against you and against each other. Forgive us, Lord, of the sins we have committed in both thought and deed. Forgive us, Lord, when we sin by failing to act. Forgive us, Lord, when we Give way to temptation and fulfill the desires of our flesh. Help us to keep in step with your spirit. And forgive us for when we fail to live in the way you have called us to. Lord, as we come before you, we want to pray for those around us. Father, there are many who are facing different trials, different challenges. Lord, we would pray that in the situations you have place them in, that ultimately they would come to see you and know you through them. Father, we ask that you would provide for their needs, that you would heal, heal them of their illnesses, that you would give them peace and comfort, that you would give them courage, that would, you would present yourself in those ways. Father, we lift up our missionaries wherever they may be located and ask that you continue to bless their efforts. We pray specifically for Noble House, Inspiration Ministries, LifeWise Academy, Miracle Tree, Gateway Wood, and all the many others that are locally looking to help alleviate the pain and the suffering within our area. Father, would you show us how we could partner alongside of them? Father, we also lift up the other churches of our area, asking that they Stand on the truth of your word and that they might be fruitful in their efforts, that you would grow, cause us to grow in brotherly love with them, showing us how we can partner together for the advancement of the gospel. Lord, we continue to pray for our local schools. May you bless the students and the staff. May you help them to continue to grow in knowledge. May you grant the staff provision to be able to accomplish their task without stress or anxiety. Through their days, may you draw them closer to yourself, helping both young and old to know that knowledge truly comes from you alone. And Father, as we look at the scope of things that are going on, sometimes we can, we can be concerned about what step do we take? What do we do? So Lord, when all we can do is pray, help us to pray without ceasing. But if you have given us the means to act, let us pray while we are moving. If we can be the answer to anybody's prayer, Lord, show us how to. If we can be the answer to our own prayer, show us how to. Encourage us, Lord, to lay down our own lives. Conser encourage us to consider our priorities, to consider our time. 
what really has captured our heart. Father, when there are things that has captured our heart that pull us away from you, these things that we worship and desire other than you, make them clear to us so that we can repent of them, so that we can learn to say, Lord, your will, not mine. Father, there is much that you have blessed us with today. And Lord, you have given us the opportunity to give some back, and for that we praise your name. We ask your blessing on both the gift and the giver. We ask that you help us to be good stewards of all that you have given us. Father, as we continue to look to the future and we see the needs that we have, we trust you for provision. We trust you for the people, for the finances, for the vision. We trust you for every aspect, Lord. We ask that you give us the grace and the understanding to minister to those who need you most. And as a church, that we may continue to seek to honor and glorify your name. And all God's people said, Amen.
you lift his name This is the day That the Lord has made Come and rejoice